Okay, we're here today interviewing Mr. Joe Bagley, born February 9th, 1925. He served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps from 1943 to 1946, achieved the rank of Tech Sergeant. We are in Brentwood, Tennessee. I'm Commander Brian Allen, friend of Mr. Bagley. Philip and Esther Lee are also present. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Okay, uh, Mr. Bagley, can you just tell us uh, kind of where you were from, where you're born, and then what uh, made you join the Army? I was born in Anniston, Alabama, as you said, on February 9, 1925. I was the youngest of five children, three brothers and a sister. Uh, my dad was a retail groceryman, and I worked in that grocery store from birth till I went to the service. Um, I um, attended Anniston High School, and along about the fall of 1943, my daddy got a little itchy and he's afraid I wouldn't finish school before they drafted me. So he went to see the draft board and asked them if he'd put me in military school would they leave me alone until I got out of high school. And they agreed to do that. I went to Georgia Military College in January of 1943, finished high school in August of 43, was drafted in September of 43. I think I had about 15 days between high school and drafted. Okay, so where did you end up going for your basic training? Okay, I went to uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri, which is a book I got here about. Um, I was in the Signal Corps. When I was inducted in Fort McPherson, the first thing they asked me in an interview was, would you like to be a paratrooper? I said, not on your life. I wouldn't want to be a paratrooper. <laughs> so uh, I wound up in the Signal Corps and took basic and special training at Camp Crowder, Missouri, which is the only place I've been before or since where if you got an order to hit the ground, you'd be sure you're going to hit on a rock. But uh, I spent 17 weeks at Camp Crowder, six weeks in basic training and 11 weeks in special training. And the worst part of that is this picture right here. Everybody in the Signal Corps had to climb a 30-foot telephone boat before they got <laughs> got out. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned to you before we went on, we had a smart guy from Brooklyn, New York, who was going to show us how to do it the first day out. He climbed right over the top of that pole and skinned it all the way to the ground. <laughs> uh, what kind of technique did they uh, teach you to climb the pole? Did you have special equipment? or? Uh, well, you had the... Oh, the, 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 the feet? I forget what you call them, but the things that stick in the pole on your shoes. Okay. And you had belts to go around the pole and go around you. And uh, you, you got to watch some uh, cadre do it okay. the first two or three days before you even tried it. Okay. But uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to do that, but I, I, I managed it. <laughs> okay. And so you're uh, training there for 11 weeks, and then were you you're sent out? I went from Camp Crowder to Camp Shenango, Pennsylvania, which was uh, waiting for a port of embarkation. And then I went to New Jersey to the port of embarkation. I went overseas in a convoy, of course. As I remember, it was 13 or 14 days on the Atlantic Ocean, and I was sick every one of those days. We had an English crew in the kitchen. And all I had to do was get to the door, and I got sick. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 13 days on the Atlantic, and I may be going too fast. Don't don't let me go too fast. If you, okay. But uh, well, just uh, tell us. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Signal Corps does and what your you know the training well, was for? Well, of course, it's uh, quite a few different sections. There's a wire section who are people who really put up these telephone poles. There's a picture here. here and I'm, of them putting up the pole. Mm -hmm. in, the, in combat, they would put up poles for wires and stuff. And then uh, uh, you had a, um, I was in the teletype section. Uh, I'm sure the reason I got that was I learned to type in high school. And so I was uh, what you at the Western Union used to use for nowadays computers <laughs> was the teletype. and. Uh, I was a uh, teletype operator, and when we got overseas, our section had a 
we had a switchboard, telephone switchboard, and we had some a couple of people in our uh, company that were trained in in the pole climbing and putting up wires and that sort of thing. Okay, so you uh, when you went overseas uh, on the troop transport, you went to England. I landed in Liverpool, England, and don't think I even unpacked my bag there. We we moved into another place in England, and we were there. They were there. We got to Liverpool in the latter part of May of 44, and uh, 43, I mean. No, 44 is right, 44. And I guess I spent about a month, almost a month, in three or four weeks in England, just more to process and to go further. And I went out of Southampton on the LCI, landed in Omaha Beach, France, July the 14th, 1944, that was my D-Day, okay. July 14th. But they had, it wasn't any real combat on the beach then, but uh, they had pushed them on, on the back pretty much. So uh, then it was a matter of going through uh, replacement depots and getting assigned to some place. And I was eventually assigned to the second replacement depot. And what we did was, uh, as a whole, was process troops going to the front line. Well, um, long uh, in the winter of '44, when it was snowing all the place and cold, it was about the time that uh, Hitler had his breakthrough in Germany and was getting into France. The Battle of the Bulge. I, yeah, I was in Looneyville, France, when that happened. At that time, they were taking people out of our outfit that claimed to have no infantry training sent to the front. I remember one guy particularly, he said, I told him I didn't have any infantry training, and he said, they said, do you know which end of a gun to shoot out of? Yeah, well, go. <laughs> and I was, I was to the point of praying that they wouldn't send me to the front line until the winter was over. I couldn't think of anything worse than being on the front line with snow on the ground. Yeah, that was a cold but, winter. Uh, they they got them stopped before they before I had to go. I stayed in the second RD the whole time I was over there. Okay, and what what were your uh, living quarters like or living conditions? Did you uh, did you live in a building or barracks? Or? We lived in a building. It was. Uh, The one that I remember was uh, one particular that I remember was uh, something like a school dormitory, uh, you know, the barracks type thing, and uh, it was very, very good. Now I did we did sleep in tents before that, before they got uh, situated where we were going to be. Mm -hmm. We had uh, these uh, eight-man tents, and that wasn't a whole lot of fun, but. Uh, but for the most part, I was just very, very fortunate. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have any real, pure enough bad, something that's unbearable. Mm -hmm. you know. Was the uh, the food prepared by army mess or was it? Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, I had mess hall. Um, early on, before I got assigned, definitely, uh, some place I was, I caught KP duty the first week I was there. And I found out that the KPs ate a lot better than the rest of us. So I volunteered for the KPD the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> and uh, you got plenty to eat. <laughs> That's good. What would be a typical, you know, day in your position as a signalman? What, you know, you work the teletype, but... Uh... Well, we, uh, we did all the... Uh, the processing of information about troops coming in, I mean, we'd get that on the teletype machine and we'd pass it on to whoever it was to go to. But um, we had, uh, oh, it was, I was so fortunate. We had four people and one teletype machine. And after I got to be a tech sergeant, I was in charge of the teletype section. Well, sometimes I'd say, well, I need to get some time off and I'd make up a schedule for those other three people. I'd take off to Paris or somewhere to have a break, you know? And uh, 
another thing I really want to tell you was that uh, my three brothers and myself were all in the European theater. Uh, my, one of my brothers was 4th Infantry Division, which he was up a little close to the front line I was. He was in the headquarters of 4th Infantry. But I got a three-day pass and went up and got to see him. Then a little later on, my oldest brother came from the state and came through my replacement depot. And so I had a few days to, to visit with him. And ironically, uh, the commander of our unit uh, was a good friend of this oldest brother of mine and about the same age. So Don tried to talk Paul into staying and he would get him assigned permanently to the depot. But he didn't want to be part of that because my next oldest brother, older brother than me had already been captured as POW. Well, Paul said, I can't stay back here. I got to go find Earl. Of course, he didn't find him, but he, Earl got back home the first of any of us, I think. But uh, ironically, four brothers and over there, and and I and we got to see each other all except the one that was a POW. He, he was captured just a short time after he got to to France. He came in through Marseille, the, okay. uh, France, and I think his unit was captured before they ever got to Germany. Wow. Well, that was part of the Battle of the Bulge, or no? No, that was way before the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. That was before the Bulge, yeah. Uh, so how long did he spend as a POW? Um, roughly, I'd say uh, a little less than a year, maybe. Okay. But he really had some tough times in that, and I heard some stories that really blow your mind out. Yeah. Um, but he, because I say he got home before any of us. <laughs> and my oldest brother came home for, and then went back, volunteered to go back for after, after the war, to, to the occupation thing. Okay. And he was over there for about a year after the war was over. Wow. So all four of the brothers were in the Army? Yep. Yeah. And okay. I had a brother-in-law also that was in the Army. So all, all the children were represented. My mother and dad had a flag with five stars on it. <laughs> That's interesting. And um, how about uh, communications back home, you know, mail and, and things like that? Was that pretty good? Or? Well, I thought it was so good then, I guess, just to hear from them. But, uh, you know, the emails, it, it, you, you weren't allowed to say too much about things. <laughs> uh, Remember one of the guy, one of the officers who was in charge of reading the mail said some some guy wrote to his mom and told him he asked her if she'd heard from Nancy Metz. Well, we were right between Nancy France and Metz. <laughs> so he said, I had to cut that out. <laughs> oh, they so they did censor the mail then. Yeah, we we got email fairly fairly. I'd. Uh, Get get a letter from home every two or three weeks. Okay. Well, like I said, on some of your, you know, you got some time off. You went to Paris and, and things like that. What were some yeah, of the I, things you got to see? The way I had an easy way to get to Paris was we had a, a, a couple of guys in the unit that were couriers, and they went to Paris every day to take the mail to the headquarters in Paris. Well, if, if you were where you could get away from duty, you could ride to Paris in the courier jeep. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do is uh, get to ride with them to Paris and uh, maybe I'd go back with them when they went back that day or maybe I'd stay the next day or two and catch the next courier back. Okay. About but, how far of a drive was that? Well, when that was going on was, uh, was after the war, I was in Brussels or near Brussels, Namur, Belgium. Okay. And it was so oh, about two or three hours okay. drive. Any other places that you liked or saw besides Paris? Or is there anything special that you, you you saw in Paris that remember? Well, of course, uh,
the shops, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, the main drag was or something. Uh, of course, it, it, Paris then wasn't, I'm sure, not what it was before or after. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a, a lot of people, it was the main thing, a lot of GIs and uh, the Arc de Triomphe, everybody had to go see that. Yeah. And it was very impressive. Okay. But other than that, uh, um, I uh, that was that was about the only place I went away from service. Uh, except I think I may have mentioned to you that I, uh, I got a three-day pass and went up and saw my brother in the Fourth Infantry Division. But I just, I just hitchhiked that, just caught a ride with whatever vehicle was going that way. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have any problem going or coming. You know, we had a nice time seeing him. He was very, mm -hmm. yeah, one, one of the, go ahead. One of the highlights of my uh, uh, What else I got here? That. It's hard to make thirty minutes out of my <laughs> army career, I, um, but. I was blessed in that I never got into any combat. The most frightful thing I, I was about to forget, uh, when we first went to France, we were, then you're talking about where we were sleeping, we were sleeping in hedgerows. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, you know, three shots meant gas. Of course, wasn't anybody expecting gas, but one night when we were in that, fields of Normandy, somebody fired three shots and everybody started hollering gas. Well, the biggest thing wrong with that was that nobody knew where the gas mask was. I mean, you know, people emptying duffel bags trying to find the gas mask, and of course it wasn't anything, it was just a, a false alarm, but <laughs> that was really frightful. <laughs> yeah, that could get your attention. Yes. Um, well, I, you know, after... Uh your, you know, during your basic training, other than, you know, the pole climbing, was there any other uh, training that you kind of found either really challenging, hard, or... Uh... Well, as I mentioned, uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri, we went through uh, sensitive infantry basic training, mm -hmm. and, you know, they'd tell you, hit the ground, well, you could just bet wherever you were in Camp Crowder, you're going to get on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> but the basic training wasn't that, wasn't... Of course, I was 18 years old, and that makes a lot of difference. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, there wasn't any place that you didn't get away much anyway. But the nearest town to Camp Crowder is something you never heard of, Neosho, Missouri. And I think that was a town of about 2,000 people. Well, you turn several thousand soldiers loose in a 2,000 population town, it <laughs> just don't work. Uh, it wasn't why we, the nearest town of any size was Joplin, Missouri. It was just across the line in Missouri. Uh, uh, in Oklahoma, I mean, Joplin, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Joplin, yeah, but anyway, Joplin was the nearest town. The camp was in Oklahoma. But we get to go to Joplin maybe once or twice while we were there. Mm -hmm. Very seldom. Okay. You didn't have a whole lot of time. By the time they got through with you, all you want to do is go to bed. Right. <laughs> Long days of training, yeah. And once in a while, you get off on a weekend and go to Neosho or Joplin. And, uh, it, did you have any make any really close friends while you were there at training and did you keep up oh, with anybody? Yeah, yes. Uh, these things got individual pictures of everybody in that thing I was in. Mm -hmm. And it's like a high school yearbook. I got signatures of all my good buddies. Okay. Uh, I, they didn't any of the ones that were there wind up with me overseas. I mean, mm -hmm. what, 
different routes. Right. But I had some really close friends, a couple from my hometown, that, that uh, happened to get in the same outfit I was in, same training I was in. Yeah, okay. And it was, uh, yeah, uh, it was a little boy from a young guy down Bacon, from uh, Macon, Georgia, who was a really good friend. Uh, and I saw him several times after we got out of the service. And I had one friend that lived up in Virginia, and he came through my hometown one day. I didn't know it. Looked me up and came by the front door. <laughs> and I thought, my gosh, I don't believe this. <laughs> and that was several years after we got out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, had, I had made some really close friends. Okay. And uh, where did your brothers, where did they end up all going to? Did they go to training together or separate places? No, my, my next oldest brother, was the first one to draft. He was just under 28 when they, the thing, I'll, goodbye dear, I'll be back in a year, which was a joke. But uh, he he was drafted first and went through uh, infantry training at uh, Augusta, Georgia. Uh, Camp Dan, I can't think of it, name of it right now. But he, he went through all the infantry training and he was the first to go overseas. Now my oldest brother was married and a little older, he was 30, 31, mm -hmm. so he wasn't in that first bunch. But uh, he did, uh, when he went in, he went to OCS in Fort Benning, uh, 90 Day Wonder. And uh, as I said, he came through by depot and m met the guy that was uh, commander, and it was my hometown, good friend of his. And, um, uh, as I mentioned before, my next older brother was in infantry also, came in through Marseille, France, and I think, I don't think he was over there two weeks, because a bunch of them were captured, and he spent the rest of his time in the war. Yeah. Do you remember where he was a POW, and like what, it was in Germany, or? No, I don't. I, if I heard it, I'd probably know it, but but I don't recall where he was. Uh, um, Did he tell you much about you know his treatment there? Was he? I mean, obviously, he probably wasn't pleasant, but oh yeah, yeah, he he had some sad stories about not getting enough to eat and not having a comfortable place to sleep. It, it was bad, I'm sure. Um, My oldest brother, after he was separated or came back to the States, he volunteered and went back over there as a civilian. And some guy, I don't know exactly what he did, but he worked over there for a couple of years, I think, hmm. as a civilian after the war was over. Okay. And so we, we, were, we were processing troops going to the front line, but then when the war was over in Germany, we moved up to Belgium and we were processing troops going to the Pacific. Either they were going to the Pacific or going home, one or the But most of them were going to the Pacific. And all of us were wondering how long we were going to last before we had to go to the Pacific. But uh, as I recall, the point system, you had to have something like 85 points, and I'm not sure how it added up. But when, <clears throat> when the war was over, I had 58. And you needed 85, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'll never make it home with 58 points. I'll have to go to the Pacific. But, Lord, Lord bless me, and I came home without going to the Pacific. Really? Were you uh, come home with a lot of group, same, uh, the, you know, men in your group all got to come home? or? Well, you know, I don't, I, in, in, in the little group that I was in, there wasn't anybody that I served with over there, no. They were all strangers. Okay. And we, did, we went through another replacement depot and processed to go back. I see. And Out of the guys who you went through training with for the Signal Corps, did some of them leave that training and go, go to the Pacific Theater? Or did most of them go to Europe? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. I don't think any of them had to go. Okay. That's pretty interesting. So then uh, you came back. Uh, where did you get discharged from the, from the Army? Fort McPherson. McPherson. Right where I started. Okay. <laughs> How, was that a... A uh, hard process? How long did that take? No, it didn't take long. Uh, 
the main thing I remember about it is my family came over there to, to get me. And somehow the word got to me that they were out somewhere waiting. And without permission, I took off one out there to see where they were. Well, man, when they, then they started looking for me while I was gone. And that, <laughs> I got a little tongue, tongue lashing for that. But uh, got out right pretty soon. And uh, I got home just before my 21st birthday. And uh, mother had a planned birthday party and had a lot of my friends, the ones that were back that, that were in high school with. 21st birthday, so left as a kid and came back as a man. <laughs> and then uh, and you, you obviously didn't stay in Anniston, Alabama. What happened uh, after that? Well, I got back in February and uh, I started school at Alabama Polytechnic Institute in March, what is now called Auburn. But my diploma says Alabama Polytechnic Institute. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, I started school right away. Cause my family was much encouragement for me to do that. Of course, I had the GI Bill and pay for it, but they were afraid if I just stayed out of school very long, I wouldn't go back to school. Mm -hmm. So I went February 43 to Auburn and uh, went straight through, uh, tried to get my dad to let me stay out one summer. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Again, he's afraid if I stayed out of summer, I wouldn't go back. So I went straight through and finished in three years. Wow. Uh, I got out in, in 46 and uh, came home and uh, my dad was the best ever was to try to get all his children involved in some kind of business. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came home over in 46, there was a pure repaired dry cleaning place that was the guy was trying to sell. My dad bought that and put me in it, and uh, that that didn't last too awfully long. <laughs> My fault. Uh, it was a rented building, and I never asked the guy about extending the lease. Well, when the lease was almost up, I went to see him. I said, "We need to talk about a new lease." He said, "No, we can't have ordered. I ordered lease that building to a manufacturing company, clothing manufacturing, Georgia." So I had to break that down, and that was about the end of that. We, we kept some of it, but it just didn't work out. Then I went to work in Atlanta for a crane company. I worked for them for two or three years, and then uh, I heard of uh, Grinnell Company in Atlanta needed a salesman in Alabama, so I went over and talked to them and got that job, and I went back to Alabama and traveled all of Alabama for them, and a little bit of Florida, and. I uh, worked for them for about nine, ten years. My brother that was in the 4th Infantry Division was working for a manufacturer in our hometown of cast iron saw pipe. Well, they uh, let their agent go in Tennessee. And Homer got with me and he said, I think about quitting my job and going to manufacturer rep. I said, Homer, you're nuts. He was a purchasing agent. At Anna I said, you've been behind the desk as a buyer for all these years, and you're going to get on the other side of the desk selling saw pipe? Yeah, yeah. Well, he did. About uh, three or four years after he went into that rep business, he contacted me and said, I'm going to have to have some help. He said, you want to come with me? You want me to get somebody else? Well, I, he was in Nashville then. I came up here. I went in with him and and did that for thirty almost thirty years. Right. He retired long before I did, but uh, and I took it over. But uh, we uh, we we covered Tennessee and Alabama and Northwest Florida. Wow, that's good here. And during that time, I moved back to Birmingham to cover the Alabama part of it. When he got ready to retire, I moved back up here. Okay. And I've been here since '79. <laughs> And uh, did you end up married and kids? Yes. Um, the Lord was good to me. I uh, had trouble finding anybody that would marry me. I wasn't really wanting to get married. But in, when I was 39 years old, 
I met this young lady who was working at Oak Ridge. She was from Pennsylvania. Well, when she came down here, she, she came just because her roommate had got a job down here. So she came and got a job just to wait and she applied for a job with the State Department. And uh, I met her in the meantime while she was down here. And I thought, you know, she's not going to leave here. She'll turn down that job in the State Department when it comes through. I looked up one day and she was gone. She went to uh, somewhere in Africa. It was supposed to be for a two-year deal. Well, I thought, well, you really messed up now, boy. Well, after she'd been over there about six months, I wrote her and I said, uh, I'm sorry I'll let you get away, but if you want to get married, quit that job and come home. She quit that job in December and came home. We got married in January. We got two, two daughters, one in Atlanta, one in Detroit, Michigan. The only thing I don't like about them is they're too far away. Mm -hmm. And both of them got two kids. One of them's got 17 and 14. One's got a two and a five. <laughs> she was like her daddy. She was late. <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. Is there anything else that you remember uh, that you want to share uh, your military service? I think I pretty much covered my military service. I can't remember anything else outstanding. All right. Uh, well, we appreciate it. Thank you. But I th thank you for the opportunity.